Welcome back into the mental game where this week's guest is former NFL star Vernon Davis. Those were suicidal thoughts. I mean, I thought about I had nothing to live for. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I drive off a bridge. Or like, I was, I remember sitting there, I was in the car, I'm like, what, why, 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 why do I, I'm living? Why am I living right now? And in this episode, Vernon opens up about his football journey where he became one of the best tight ends in NFL history and won a Super Bowl, but he also shares his own mental health struggles off the field, watching his mother battle addiction, losing both his brother and his sister recently, and so much more in this amazing conversation. But first, I want to tell you about man therapy, and guys, I am talking to you because, look, we have to be comfortable being vulnerable and talking about our mental health. Health, and that's why I want you to go to mantherapy.org today to find amazing tools and resources to help you the best with your mental health. But now it is time for the latest episode here on The Mental Game with Vernon Davis. <laughs> Welcome back into the mental game. As you can see, I got a very special guest sitting next to me, former NFL tight end and newly nominated for the NFL Hall of Fame. I don't want to, you know, jinx anything or make you nervous about it, but congrats on that. Vernon Davis, thanks so much for coming on the mental game, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I, uh, I feel really small sitting here in these in these uh, high chairs <laughs> next to you, but I interview athletes all the time, uh, so I guess I'm used to it. Your, your life story, mm -hmm. super powerful. You played a long time in the NFL, but you've always been someone that's had you know, mm -hmm. your hand dipped in different buckets, whether it's acting, you have a new book out and, and just being a mental health advocate, everything that you've done throughout your life has been really purposeful, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to go through that whole journey, but just how you doing, man? It's, it's uh, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well. I'm doing really, really well. Uh, I'm taking it one day at a time and just uh, just going with uh, with the flow, the flow of life. Well, you got a lot happening right now. Uh, movies, books, mm -hmm. still talking football, obviously. Uh, but the first thing I ask everyone here on The Mental Game is what mm -hmm. does mental health mean to them? And it's a unique question because mm -hmm. we all have different journeys and experience it differently. But actually the same thing, what does mental health mean to you? Mental health to me is being able to exercise your mind in a way where you're continuing to work on yourself in the best way possible from therapy to uh, meditation to your, your spiritual, being fully equipped with the spiritual side of your journey. Mm -hmm. And um, just just working on yourself because every day, I feel like every day we wake up, our mind is harboring greed, self-pity, hatred, all the most negative things you can think of. And once we learn to understand that, we understand that our life is a continue is a is a our life is a is a is an ongoing uh process of uh, just feeding our minds mm -hmm. with the the positive things in life to get yep. rid of those negative things well it's it's something that we all go through. People mm. ask all the time why I do this or why I started the show. Mm. It's because every single person struggles. doesn't matter if you're mm. a sports reporter, you're playing the NFL, you're in movies, right. you're sitting at home listening to this right now. Every single person struggles. Mm. And so that's why I think it's so important to talk about the journey and what mm. we've been through. And, and with mental health, you know, especially in sports, we were talking right mm. before we started rolling. I mean, I know when you went into the league, this is something no one talked about at all in the locker room. Maybe one or two guys did, but I know when I started and that was 2014 going in locker rooms as a sports mm. reporter, I didn't hear about it. I didn't know if there was a team psychiatrist. Mm. When did you first ever think about your mental health? I first started thinking about my mental health my first year in the NFL. Yeah? Yeah. It was what? my first year because I felt, I felt like it was something that I needed because I didn't understand... I understood life, but you know, as a young man, as you continue to to grow and evolve, you run into situations, you have different experiences. And sure. for me, the experiences that I had was trying to figure out how to be, become a leader on the team that I was on. Yeah. So that led me to seeing a, seeing a therapist mm -hmm. just to work on uh, just my mental health and, and learn to control like my emotions. 
Was that the first time you had gone to therapy your rookie year in the NFL? That was probably my first time in therapy, yeah. Did you – who did you go to to ask, like, is this where I, should, where I should go? Did you talk to, you know, family, friends, yeah. teammates? Normally when you're, on a, when you're on a team, most teams have an assigned uh, therapist. Right. They have someone that, that helps their players. And, you know, you kind of – I think it's your it's, – um, it's a league rule. You know, every, every team must have a therapist. Yep. On site. Uh, or just read, uh, readily available. Sure. For guys, because guys go through a lot. They struggle. Yeah. I mean, um, and for me, I felt like it was a it was the one of the best situations I ever walked into. Yeah. Well, for you at that time, I mean, you're a trailblazer as being someone that has talked about mental health in sports. Mm-hmm. You know, we were just talking about Nate Burleson, Brandon Marshall, Kevin right. Love. Like those, uh, these are all guys just like you that sought help really early in their career mm-hmm. when no one else did what gave yeah. you the courage to ask for help so soon i think um i don't i've always wanted to be i always lived in the moment and i wanted to make sure that i always i was fully equipped with everything that i needed yeah <clears throat> and um to me when it comes to anything in life especially football it's all mental yeah you know the the physicality of the game is there it's going to always be there but if you don't have your mental the a good a good mental capacity to be able to uh, learn the playbook, um, uh, be accountable, and all the, the those different nuances that you need to be a great teammate, you, you're you not going to be able to play the game. It was really hard for me not to plug the name of the show, The Mental Game, during that answer, because yeah. <laughs> it would have fit perfect. Um, growing up, did, did, did you ever think about mental health? I mean, I know that, you know, in your family, you, you know, your mom was dealing with addiction. Mm. Um, you grew up with your grandparents, if I remember right. Yeah. And, and so for you, was mental health ever talked about or was it kind of the stigma that we all most know of like, hey, especially if you're a man, don't right. talk about it, just tough through it. Yeah, I, I never really thought about it. I, kn- I saw it around me. I knew that my family was struggling, but I didn't really know how to identify it. Yeah, I just thought my mom was on drugs. My uncle was a, was an alcoholic, but there's always the root of someone's behavior, right? Right. And for me, I feel like my whole family was plagued with mental health issues. Like I lost five family members since 2019. They all died because of mental health issues. Mm. So that's something that runs deep in my family and addiction. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so it's it's it's, it's there. Well, I didn't tell you this before we started rolling. I battled alcoholism, um, runs in my family. I've been sober for, I guess, 18, 19 months now. So it's like mm-hmm. life changing when you're able to see, yeah. seek help and, and see that change. But growing up as a kid, seeing that around you with mm-hmm. addiction and seeing um, you know, your mom, your uncle struggling, mm-hmm. did that motivate you to maybe not go down that path? And, and was football something that kind of gave you that opportunity early in life? Where you're like, oh, wow, I, I might be good at this. I might be able to do something with it. Yeah, I had a lot of pain. I had a lot of joy. And I think the biggest thing was that underlying pain that I had. It caused me to excel in everything that I touched, from mm-hmm. schoolwork to sports. And every time... I suited up and walked on a football field or laced up my shoes to run on the track. Yeah. I thought about my upbringing. I thought about my mom. I thought about the hurt that she caused me. And it allowed me to be able to um, have resilience. Yeah. And that's why I'm sitting here today. The the hurt that your mom put on you, which like, mm-hmm. I, this is a show where you open up as much as you want. I mm-hmm. respect boundaries. Yeah. But can you take me in what that pain was like as a child watching your mom suffer from addiction? Yeah, I mean, if you can imagine being a kid standing, standing on the playground with their friends and they're pointing, hey, look, there's your mom. And I'm just turning and I'm looking, I'm like, you know, just this whole darkness just covers me. I remember that moment vividly, mm-hmm. like it was yesterday. But that did something to me. It um, it was traumatizing. Yeah. And when you have so much trauma that lives inside of you, it could even cause you to go this way or that way. And for me, I wanted to go in a direction where I was able to change the narrative. Yeah. You know, just because you're born into a, a world doesn't mean you have to take on whatever it is that you're you're um you're experiencing. Right. Right. So I, I went the the other direction. But it was it was very painful, man. Just very dark and I felt lonely and um just angry. Yeah. I was always I, I was I was angry, but inside it was controlled mm-hmm. inside of me. But I, I used that anger and everything that I did from football to schoolwork 
just all those things. And it, it kind of, it propelled me to just different heights. Mm -hmm. It was taking that pain and turning it into passion and purpose, right. which looking back in the moment, you probably didn't realize you were doing, but as life moves mm -hmm. on and you, and you achieve things, I mean, mm -hmm. you're one of the top picks in the NFL draft. Mm -hmm. You're, you're one of the all time greats at tight end. It's like you have those things that build you that in those moments you don't realize are helping you, but even if they hurt, they can't help you get to the things and live out those dreams and be the best version of yourself. For you, when you started to see it work with football, when did, you know, playing at Maryland or the NFL become a reality to you, you think? Um, playing in the NFL? Yeah, like when did you think that like that dream was reality? I always knew I was going to make it because I had no other choice. Mm. I knew I was going to make it. I had to make it because I, I knew that if I made it, I will become a voice. I will have a platform to not just help my family, but help so many other people. And I wanted it as bad as I wanted to breathe. When yeah. you want something that bad, there's nothing that's gonna stand in, stand in your way. Yeah. Like I tell everybody, I made sure that I was always, um, well, I was always just, um, not cognizant, but I was always, I always treated my schoolwork like I treated football. Mm. But I went to school for football. Fair. Because I knew that that was my way out. Yeah. I didn't have another way. So I had to make sure that I was staying in high school. I made sure that I was the last one on the field, the first one there. Mm. It's powerful. And you set an example, maybe for guys around you, of course, if you're a team captain or leader on the team, but you set an example mm. for yourself and a standard. And I, mm. you know, I, I say this sometimes and I think I might sound cocky. And I, I think you share this mentality that like mm. everything I've ever wanted to do, I've done it. And it's not because I like think that I have this ego that I can take down anything. It's like, no, because I work my ass off and I like want to do those things that I've always dreamed of. That sounds like the same type of thing for you where you realize it on a night like draft night. You get drafted and I think you're the sixth, were you the sixth overall pick? Sixth overall pick. And, yeah. and you get drafted by the 49ers out in yeah. San Francisco. Seeing that dream come to reality with all of the, the, the obstacles and adversity that you face, whether it be... You know, growing up watching addiction with your mother to, to I think you transferred schools, maybe in middle school, junior high, mm -hmm. um, all that adversity growing up to finally have that dream and that call become reality. What was that moment like for you? Yeah, that, that moment was surreal, of course. But I just thought back about all the trial and error that I faced and my mom walking up and down the street. Uh, just my family struggling in general. And just uh, my grandmother being able to to help her for all the love that she gave mm -hmm. my six siblings and I. It just it was just a combination of everything coming together, and like wow, it was the most amazing feeling on that day mm -hmm. when I got that call on that phone. I picked it up, and they said, "Welcome to the 49ers. <laughs> it was something like that, but that was just I couldn't help. I couldn't hold my tears back. Yeah. Well, I can tell you talking now, even thinking about it, it makes you a little bit emotional. And I'm sure the ride throughout the NFL and getting to have your family with you, um, whether it be your grandmother, obviously your brother got to play in the league with you too. Um, that had to be so powerful for so many years to, to know that you made it. And then you go on this ride where you get to a Super Bowl, don't win it. You get to go back. You do win it with the Broncos mm. in 2015. Um, just the highs and lows of the NFL, how did you balance that with your mental health? Because that is an ultimate roller coaster when mm -hmm. you're talking about life and sports. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it is a battle because you, I mean, think back, I think back as a young man, 22, 21, 22 years old, with a, that's a millionaire. Yeah. Right? You have so much you can do, you can get into your, your it's, like a, it's like the biggest playground you've ever had. Fair, yeah. Right? There's money, there's drugs, there's, woman yeah how do you balance all of this with trying to be one of the best players in the game of football on the professional level yeah right that's a lot man yeah you have to be the most focused person you've ever been in your entire life yep right right now at this moment this is the moment where you really have to focus if you're going to make it because most people we see this all the time a lot of guys make it Right, yep. they get from out of there. They go from the hood. Uh, they go from their mom being on drugs, their dad being an abuser, dad not around. Yeah. To all of a sudden, they've arrived to this. I mean, this dream has come true. Yep. 
But now they get there and all of a sudden, yep, the party, they lose it all. Yeah, it's... They lose it all only because they lost their focus. Hmm. They lost their focus. When did you see inside locker rooms? You played with some great leaders, whether it be Peyton Manning, different guys at quarterback, but all through the locker room. When did you see, obviously we're talking about the mental game and staying focused on the field, but when did you see that change where guys felt more comfortable having conversations with each other like you were having with the team psychiatrist as a rookie in the NFL? When did you see that stigma change? Because I look, I know what's said in the locker room. Mm -hmm. I know kind of the, you know, the, uh, the mentality as, especially as, as athletic men do not mm. want to open up. You know, I, as a reporter, I got shut down many times trying to ask questions different, different ways. Um, but just the stigma inside the locker room with mental health. When did you see that start to change and guys start to open up to each other? I saw mental health issues start starting to change when, um, I think when, when some of the biggest players on the team started to take a, just take a chance. Yeah. And open up, become more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I saw that. I saw a shift then because it, you, you know, if, if I'm a guy going into the NFL and I see Frank Gore sitting down with the therapist, I I'm, I want to try that. Yeah, it's it's a you you incorporate those things into what you're doing on a daily basis to prepare for the game. Yep. And once we understand that, that's the biggest. That is the biggest part of playing the game. Then you you realize, hey, I have to do this. This is important. For me, it's important for my family, and it's important for longevity. Mm -hmm. the, the word vulnerability stands out to me, and I'll tell you the favorite quote that I've had on this show is Kevin Gates, who mm -hmm. you look from the outside, it's big, swole, rapper, teardrop uh -huh. tattoo, would think nothing's wrong with him. He's battled his own suicidal thoughts and mental health struggles. Yeah. And he told me that you know vulnerability isn't a weakness, it's a strength. Mm -hmm. And so breaking that stigma with men, specifically with black men, mm -hmm. is something that motivates him and that's why he opens up what was the motivation for you with this vulnerability um during your career but now afterwards i mean you've been really really open throughout you know your new book throughout social media mm -hmm. throughout doing interviews like this why did you want to be vulnerable about your own story i wanted to be vulnerable about my own story because i want to life is all about giving somebody something that they don't have mm -hmm. or something they're searching for something they need yeah do you know what i you know what i mean when i was going through panic disorder first thing i did was scramble for books. I needed to absorb tons of information to help me figure out what I was going through. Yeah. And um if I'm giving my story and I'm I have this platform, I'm this this football player, this this former professional football player who played at the highest level and now I'm going on and doing other things. And you know, my life is just it's flowing. Yeah. Right? People see that. They see mm -hmm. this guy who has this platform and now when they read about my story, everything that I had to go through and everything that I'm suffering with, they can relate to that. Yep. And they see that there's hope because I, I've i succeeded. I've succeeded in this war, mm -hmm. you know, this battle, and I'm still going. If I can do it, they can do it. So you, I give them hope. Well, the panic disorder and the anxiety that you faced, I want to ask you about that. When did you start seeing that affect you emotionally mental health wise did you have panic attacks in in the locker room or uh, after games like what where did it flare up where you go oh shit something's wrong right now i need help yeah i was um i was in i was in training camp and i had a roommate i just woke up in the middle of the night heart racing i just felt awful and that was the moment right there where I knew I had to change my life. And a lot of it came from, I think the negative energy that I had during that time. I had a lot of negative en negative energy. I was going to clubs, I was I was partying. I was, I just wasn't living my best life. Mm -hmm. And I think when, you, when you're battling with what you're supposed to do and where you feel like you need to be, and you have that over there that you're doing, yep. and it's not right, then that's when you, that's when that tug of war starts to start to happen. So I knew I had to change my life around, and and that was that moment for me right there in training camp when I was in San Francisco. Do you look back at that as your life changing rock bottom moment of like splashing the water in the face or just kind of facing? I mean, we're talking about Nate Brillson. He woke up when he was injured mm -hmm. at a hotel room in bed, and he had got like super drunk, and there's pills yeah. next to him, and he realized like. 
I could have chose that or I could have flipped the switch and changed. Right. Do you kind of see that as your moment in, in that training camp room? Yeah, that was my moment. I mean, not only was that the moment, it, I think that whole year and that season was the moment for me. I mean, I felt like I had nothing to live for. Mm -hmm. I had this the biggest weight on my back. I mean, it was it had the most weight on my back. I felt like I was in like the, the darkest place I've ever been, ever. I had nothing to live for. It's like I'm like I I was I remember sitting there. I was in the car. I'm like what? Why? Why? Why do I? Why do I I'm, I'm living? Why am I living right now? Mm. Like life doesn't even mean anything to me. I just felt that way. I just the feeling I had, but I I was able to like get like get out of it. I was for I just I just broke away. It's like I broke away from like a like the bad guy. Yeah, and and I escaped. And when I escaped. I was like, you know what? There's so much to life is precious. Life is is everything. This is a, a gift for us to be able to see something that we've never seen before from the moment we were born. Mm -hmm. We opened our eyes. The gift of life. And um I think since since that day, I, it was it's been always been like a constant battle in me just 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 working on myself, my mental health, my my spirit and just who I stand for as a person. The question that you ask yourself of what do I have to live for? Or why am I here? I have asked myself that and struggled with that since I was 14 years old all the way up to two mm -hmm. years ago. And it's a very, very scary thing you ask yourself mm -hmm. and you start to think about. Have you ever struggled with suicidal thoughts? Were those suicidal thoughts in that moment of maybe I shouldn't be here? Those were suicidal thoughts. I mean, I thought about I had nothing to live for. I'm like, yeah. I mean, do I drive off a bridge. Or like, when you're thinking like that, it's it's those are you're basically trying to figure out a way. Um, okay, you feel like you should. Um, if you had a gun beside you, shoot yourself. Pretty much, yeah. that's one of those moments. Yep. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it, and you can't control it. Yeah. It's, if, if you haven't experienced it, you don't know what I'm talking about. Right. And if you look at, uh, if you go back in the history of time, whether it was 10 years from now or or a year ago, there have been cases where, you know, celebrities that we know of or people we know in general have been in that same state. Yeah. And they've taken their life. So what's the, I, I'm trying to figure out What's the parallel between, not the parallel, but what's the difference between someone like myself versus someone like them? Right. What, what, what did I have in that given moment, in that given day or week that allowed me to like break free mm -hmm. and say, no, this is not, taking my life isn't the right, best thing to do? Well, I had, you know, one of my friends from, I went to college at Cincinnati, Corey Cunningham, who was an offensive lineman for the Giants, who took his own life. Um, six, seven months ago. And this is a guy that I went back and forth with and he knew exactly what I was doing and was loving the mental health stuff I was doing. And it's, you know, I work with a lot of professionals now that, that tell me how we can help each other in those moments and what happens. And it's a very instantaneous thing, especially in young people where something happens, whether it's online or in life, you know, for me, a breakup was fueling a lot of it and some deaths in the family for my own personal battles. But within two or three hours of having that thought, it's over because they didn't feel like they could open up and be safe in those moments. Before you had mentioned since 2019, you had, I think, five family members that were battling, you know, some mental health struggles. Mm -hmm. What was that effect on you watching that after what you had been through struggling with your own suicidal thoughts? Well, I think because I had so much going on in my life. I think when you when you develop something like that, it's a combination of trauma. It's just trauma adding up. Yeah. One on top of another. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what it was. It was me watching my family, uh, um, ex the experiences that I had with them. My brother developing paranoid schizophrenia. He probably would have been a uh, first round draft pick as well. Mm -hmm. Him going into a mental institution from out of nowhere. Uh, my mom, my dad not being there, just all of those different things, and then just battling with the with the demon inside myself. Um, 
it just it put me in that space. Yeah, it put me in that space. So that's that's if I go back and I just think on like that day when it when it initially happened, it's just the combination of all those different experiences, the trauma, the different layers of trauma that I the surfacing in my body. You keep saying the word trauma, it's something that affects all of us. And if you hold it in, you don't get it out, it's going to keep haunting you and, mm. and hurting you. Um, what was it like to get some of that trauma out of you when you first started going to therapy or talking to friends and family, teammates being open about it? I imagine well, it had to help you a lot. Well, I wish I would have got on top of it faster sooner yeah. because you it's it's we, we don't think about like what's gonna happen, right? We're gonna lose so many people. If you're living on this earth from eighty to ninety years old, mm -hmm. you're gonna lose a lot of people that you love. Yep. And you find in life that there's some people that you love more than the person you thought you loved most. Right? Yeah. I thought I loved my mom most, but when my brother passed, that really had an effect on me. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why I say I wish I'd have got a hold of my trauma sooner. Because if you don't, you're going to find that when people pass or you go through certain things, mostly when you lose someone, right? that trauma that you have in your body, it's going to come, it's going to surface in a way where you might not be fully equipped. Yep. You, you might be in a situation where you actually take your life because mm -hmm. you didn't get a hold of what you needed to get on top of a lot yep. sooner. You see what I'm saying? I do. And it's something that can affect you personally and the people around you. You mentioned the loss of your brother. Mm -hmm. Losing Vante at, at 35 years old, I know it's recent, and so I, I, I'm sorry for, for opening up or offering you to open up about this, but I, I just, I can't help but ask because I see the emotion that you have talking about mm -hmm. your family and your brother. Going through that, um, what, losing him, how did that affect you and your family? And, and we mentioned a rock bottom moment you had when you were you know, young in your career mm -hmm. in training camp, I have to imagine that call or that moment you realized that you lost him yeah. had to be a rock bottom moment. Yeah, that was a rock. That was a that was a um, definitely a, a moment that I I never thought I'd see. But I remember being in the house, w waking up at seven in the morning to a phone call, and I know when I get a phone call from South Florida at seven a.m., it's not good. Mm -hmm. um, his assistant was on the phone. We Vontae's in his in his training room. He's not breathing. So first thing I can think is just this can't be true. This can't this is not right. He's not breathing. It's a chance that he he's going he's dead he's dead, probably if he's not breathing. Mm -hmm. That's um I I faced that experience, one of those that kind of experience before with my mom. When she wasn't breathing, she ended up losing her life. But my whole body, I just went cold and I felt weak and I, I it was it was a feeling that I, I've never felt before. Yeah. And just going through that moment of grief over the first two, three weeks was um a big challenge for me. Nothing nothing mattered to me. Yeah. Like I was at I was at a moment where nothing really I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about cars. I didn't care about the house I had. I just wanted, it It just, it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered to me at that moment was family. Mm -hmm. The people I love, people close to me, family and friends. That's the only thing I wanted to be around. That's the only thing that, I, that really existed to me. But anything that I had, whether it's money, cars, houses, um, jobs, yeah, none of that mattered to me. My career didn't matter. Did you find yourself six, seven months ago when this happened, putting yourself not on purpose, but it, did you go into another depression, anxiety, really tough moment in your life? Oh yeah, I did. I had to take some medication. Okay. And was this yeah. a new darkness that maybe you hadn't faced before when you're losing? I I, I know well, how close you guys were. It's yeah. Well, it was one thing when he died, but then my sister died a month later. She was 28. She died from a heroin overdose. Mm. So as you can see, I've come from a drug infested family. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's, I don't know. Uh, like I said before, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, if you have 10, six to 10 siblings, maybe some of you go this way, some of you go that way. And that's what happened in my family. 
Some of us went this way, others went that way. And but Vontae, for instance, like he was he was he was one of those guys that were before he got drafted and as he was playing the game of football, he was on it, man. His focus, his thought process, the way he lived his life, a healthy, active lifestyle. Yeah. But all of a sudden he lost his focus. Mm. You know, like I said, a lot of people get up there, but then they fall right back down. Yeah. And that's why I couldn't, that's why I had a hard time trying to figure it out. Like, this is a, a man who was just like me. Yeah. He, he The way he was thinking, he was on top of it. Mm. But when you lose that focus, you can, you can slip. You can, you, you can, you can, you can fall just like that. I know it's a, a tough question to answer and, and you don't have to, if you don't want to, but when you look back at, you know, those those last moments you had with your brother and you mentioned his focus slipping C- can you point to maybe what he was struggling with or what caused that focus to slip the people you let in your life the people in your circle can be a negative influence on you they can get you to do certain things that you you really know you shouldn't be doing mm-hmm. but through peer pressure if you're not fully equipped spiritually yep then you can fall short and a lot of people don't understand like even if for, for a person, take a person for example, right? Like if you if you come from a family of addiction, yeah, and maybe there's um, a popular uh, drug or something that's yeah. that's not that innocuous, um, but not that um, um, harmful right. to you. It might work for for other people but it might not work for you because you have an addiction living in your body correct you you, you know what i mean yeah that one thing that you're you're doing may cause you to go to something something else yeah so we have to be everyone's different and we have to be aware of the the way things work in life mm-hmm. and when you lose lose sight of that that's when you like i said you fall you can fall short whether it's drugs it could be anything yeah well, that's what addiction is. It, it's something where like my best friends can go out and have a couple beers, or maybe they get hammered on a, on a Friday or Saturday night. Right. But me, it's I'll have ten beers on the couch sitting by myself on a Tuesday night. Like right. it's just it's different for me. Mm-hmm. And so watching that around you and, and having the strength and courage to to not just help yourself but others, maybe break that mm-hmm. mold that you had, that your family had struggled with, is so like I give you so much props for that because it's so so incredibly strong of you to do but in that moment of losing both your your brother and sister in such a short window Mm. how did you not get back to that thought that you had before of why am i here because i know my purpose in life i know i know there's people in my family people that love me who need me Mm -hmm. and the thing that i pray for is longevity that i'm around to fulfill my purpose and and do as many things as I can, that I can possibly do to to make an impact on this world, leave leave behind a legacy. Yeah, and it's it's important to me to be able to live a very productive life and produce good fruit through the people I let in my life, the energy that I attract, the energy that I give out, how I treat people, and um, my my essence, my. My, my character, my integrity, everything that I stand for, you know, that's that's very important to me. And I want to be able to have an opportunity to to live for that and let people see this light that I have to give, you know, this light that I have to shine. Um, so that's, that's what I believe. Your vulnerability is so powerful in the way you mm-hmm. speak and talk and tell your story. And I'm so grateful for that. And I think another way that you obviously have done that is through writing this book. Mm-hmm. And it just came out in August. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's I've dug into it a little bit. I just love how you were able to open up about your story, both on and off the field. What made you want to write this book? Was it maybe some of those early times in your life when you started going to therapy, started opening up, realizing that telling our story, we can relate to people and help each other. Um, what, what was the reason you wanted to write a book? I wanted to write a book because I don't feel like there's any, there's no, you can write a book at any given moment. You don't have to wait till you're 70, 80 years old. Yeah. You don't, I mean, life is so short. You don't even know if you're going to make it to 70, 80 years old. Right. My purpose in writing a book is to give something, give a piece of myself, give uh, something that people can can relate to, and I feel like 
you can relate to anyone's life. Mm -hmm. There's something in your life that I can take from you and add to mine. Yeah. Vice versa. And I want to give that. I feel like somebody, at some any given moment, someone's going to be, be able to look at my book and feel that, um, and say that this book helped. Well, you talked about in the book, you know, your NFL career, on and off the field, family, mm. struggles. When you say it, it, you want it to help them, what do you want someone to take away when they're reading it? What what piece do you want them to go, oh, I mean, I know it's different for everyone, each reader, mm. it's a unique story, kind of like our mental health stories. Uh -huh. But what is your goal that someone can take that tangibly and take it away and go, wow, I can do this now or I can feel this way? If I'm stepping back and I'm reading this book, I don't even know this guy. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Um, but if I look at this book, I see a guy who's been so successful, extremely successful on on a on a major level. And I'm looking, I'm like, okay, he played in the NFL 14 years. But how do you get to the NFL? And I and you see that. You see the journey of him going from this to making it to the NFL. And you're like, wow, he he made it to the NFL and despite his mom being on drugs, his dad not being around and his grandparents raising him with six siblings. Wow. Okay, you go further on to the book. His brother has paranoid schizophrenia. He, he he lost his brother and his sister. His granddad died. Like, wow, this is crazy. I mean, he, he struggled with mental issues while he's playing in the NFL. And gosh, he managed to go on and become an actor and make a, a a music album. He has three kids. Wow, this is crazy. I'm like, this guy has went through the fire. I mean, how do you go from that, going from the hood in, a, in, a, in an environment where you, if someone was riding down the street, he looked at you and said, this kid's not gonna make it. Someone probably rode down the street, drove down the street and said, gosh, I feel, I feel bad for this kid, mm -hmm. right? How yeah. do you go from that to sitting in this seat. That's what I want people to see. Mm. I want them to take that from this book. You can do anything. It doesn't matter what you what, what yep. you're up against. Your mom could be on drugs. Your 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 your, your dad could someone could, could could murder your dad. Your 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 aunt could could raise you right, and she could be on drugs, but you still can make it out. Mm -hmm. You can struggle with. Um, Depression, you still can make it out. Yeah, You can lose some of the close people in your life, but you still can make it out, right? Yeah, Nothing's impossible. You can have a dream and a, and a desire to do something. You can do it. That's what you see in my book. I, that's not inspiration and motivation. I don't know what it is. I was about to say, man, after that, you should be a preacher. Um, yeah. But like just talking with you for this half hour that we've had together, mm -hmm. I love hearing the stories of the NFL and I'm going to ask you some fun things here in a sec about your time in the league and off the field. But I have spent the last two years making it my mission to help save lives and felt like I'm in serving my true purpose now and hearing you talk about mm -hmm. the book and why you're vulnerable and, and all the creative things you're doing now. I know that you absolutely loved your time in the league and you are an amazing athlete and one of the best tight ends mm -hmm. to ever do it. But this is your purpose to help mm -hmm. people. I mean, would you agree with that? This feels like your purpose to help people? Yeah. I love helping. I love creating smiles. I love giving. I, I just, my heart is filled with so much love, man. I don't, I don't have an ounce of hatred in my heart. And it's nothing better in life than to give someone something, something that they can, they can use. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know right. what I mean? Well, something they can use. When you see that your story or your book can help someone when you get you get the same dms or random emails that i get where it's like hey i saw this i went through the same thing thank you it helped me take that step forward or maybe someone goes to therapy for the first time after reading about your struggles and how you reached out for help as a rookie for me that's like the light bulb moment of wow telling this is all worth it if it just helps one person mm -hmm. do you feel that same way when, when you're able to you know talk to people about your book or just share your story with a fan maybe that recognizes you from playing the league Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I, I get, I come across that all the time. It, it's so, it's so powerful when someone can tell you, and you might only have five minutes with them, but they tell you how something helped that you said helped them. Oh yeah. And oftentimes, oh, yeah. I can find in those conversations 
something they say helps me going forward and kind of yeah. motivates you to keep serving that purpose, right? Absolutely. It motivates you. It motivates you. But uh, but the biggest thing, I just want people to see that I'm only human. I'm real, man. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't, and I'm, I'm only human and I'm not perfect. Yeah. I've done so many things that I shouldn't have done, you know, from spending money on women and, and, and just all kinds of things, man. It's just, you know, I, I'm only human. But one thing I've never done was drugs. I never touched drugs because I knew that I had that, uh, that addiction running through my blood. Mm, that's, it reminds me of Sauce Gardner. I covered him in college and he told me that he never touched any alcohol, never did any drugs. He saw what it did to people around him and he mm. wanted to make it. Same with Chad Johnson. I did a, a mm. podcast with him about a year ago and he has never touched alcohol. When he went out clubbing, mm. he had like cranberry juice or just lemonade with one of them fancy, you know, straws or mm. umbrellas to fit in with the guys in bottle service. Yeah. But his mom was an alcoholic and so he never wanted to touch it because he saw mm. the effect that it had on him. Oh, wow. And, and so, yeah, just, just sharing those stories are really, really powerful. So yeah. thank you for your vulnerability that you have in the book on this show, this interview in your life. You are truly like serving your purpose, man. I'm proud yeah, of you. I appreciate it, thank you. Breaking the stigma in sports and as men is something that Vernon and I have talked about throughout this episode because there is such a big stigma in sports and in men in our society. And that's why we have to be vulnerable and talk about how we're feeling. And that's why I want you to go to mantherapy.org today to find amazing tools and resources that are just for men. They have this amazing thing called their 18 point head inspection. It's a quick two minute test that asks you basic everyday questions about your mental health, your life, your work, just trying to help find the best ways to get you help with your mental health. Again, go to mantherapy.org today to take their 18 point head inspection and help you find the best ways to take care of your mental health. Suicide can be tough to talk about, but that's why The Happiness Project is helping break the stigma. After losing their classmate Nick, his friends knew they had to do something to help save lives. So, The Happiness Project was born, a clothing brand to raise awareness for mental health and suicide prevention with t-shirts and hoodies to start a conversation and let people know they are not alone. To learn more, follow at Happiness Project on social media and use the code MENTALGAME at happinessproject.com for 15% off your first order. If I can, in this final like five minutes, go through some rapid fire, just kind of fun questions mm -hmm. throughout the league, maybe off the field too. Obviously, you're doing acting, you know, mm -hmm. doing some movies, your own shows. Uh, favorite memory in the league? I mean, obviously, like winning a Super Bowl, you can point to that. And I won't say no, like that's that's a huge accomplishment. It's something you dream mm -hmm. of. But can you point to, to one game or one moment, one touchdown where you're like, man, that was awesome? One one touchdown. Yeah. I, when we first went to the playoffs, we played against the um, the New Orleans Saints. Mm -hmm. And I scored the game winning catch. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were seconds left on that clock. And I was able to pull through for my team. That was the most miraculous moment I've ever had as a dream. But I mean, yeah, every kid always dream of hitting that game winning shot. Yep. For me, that was that game winning shot. God, that's incredible. Yeah. It's, was that at home or? That was uh, that was at home, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. I, I mean, I've worked in the Dome. I cover, I didn't tell you this before, I covered the Saints for two years. So like that oh, place man. can go rowdy. Why do football players, even basketball players tell me too, they love scoring on the road more than home. Is it that silence? I mean, maybe you don't feel the same way, but just. They love scoring on the road. because of, Maybe because of the pressure, the stakes are higher. Yeah. And you have something to prove a lot more to prove when you're not at, at your home. Okay. I mean, you, and you, you're kind of making the crowd, the audience quiet. In yeah. A sense. Fair. That's what they always tell you me. Like I mean? Their it's, favorite thing to do. It's <laughs> the pressure, the pressure. I think when you're a top at, when you're one of those top tier athletes, you, you thrive off of the pressure. Yeah. Speaking of top tier athletes, you, you are one yourself and then you want a Super Bowl with mm -hmm. Peyton Manning in, uh, in Denver. I just had, Eric Decker on maybe like two months ago and he talked about just how close that team was and how that was just a dream come true moment for mm -hmm. you guys to win it all. When did that set in on the field right after when you see confetti fall or see the family come down to say, Hey, like how amazing was that dream to finally come true after yeah. losing one before? I think it was the confetti. Yeah. You, you come to a realization that gosh, we actually did it. This is amazing. Like you go all the way. I mean, it's like it's a very it's a the, the line is extremely thin. Yeah. When it comes to winning and losing. So to 
tread on that thin line and make it all the way to the Super Bowl is, I mean, you can't you can't make it up, man. It, it's just, I mean, it's it's wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> I see. Yeah, saying, it's like, for people that it's are like, getting, it's wonderful. It's the most amazing thing. For people that are just listening, not watching, you need to go on YouTube and watch this or on Instagram because your smile during that answer is the biggest smile oh, maybe I've like, seen on this show. I go back. I'm just going back to that moment. It's just, it's the most wonderful thing. When you guys had such a special team and to do it, I know you loved all the guys on there. Um, but was uh, Derek Wolf on that team too? Derek Wolf, yeah, yeah. So he went to Cincinnati with me. That's, nice. That's awesome. Yeah, he's a he's a great dude. So yeah, like great super dude. Op, uh, super yeah. open about his mental health as well. Yeah. Um, Anything else that like football you can look back at and go, man, this has really helped me in life. And really, um, I look back and just smile as big as you just did over. And football? Yeah. Or life. I mean, you're doing so much now between movies, acting, producing. Like, um, Yeah, I mean, I can go to a lot of different moments. I go to a lot of moments. Draft day, first child being born. Um seeing myself on the big screen for the first time, mm -hmm. making a music al album. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of writing a book. There's so many different chapters I can go to. Well, there's an important question that came to my mind when you talked about your first child being born, going through what you went through as a kid, with mm. multiple siblings, parents that were struggling, mm. maybe not not around. What do you tell your kids or instill in them to help them stay the course that you had of having that strength and that when adversity faces you, you don't go down, you rise to the occasion? Because I have to imagine as a father, going through what you went through as a kid changes your relationship with your own kids. Yeah, it does. It makes you, everything that I went through with my mom and dad not being there for me, like, it's extremely important for me to show up to everything that my kids do. Mm -hmm. And it's it's innate. It lives in me. Yeah. It's so easy for me to get up and go to their stuff or, uh, you know, just make it to my son's football game or take him down to West Virginia to on a visit. Mm -hmm. All of those things. It's just, it doesn't matter how many kids I have, it's, it's easy for me to do something like that. Yeah. It's again, not at all. This, the smile on your face says yeah. it all. I want to get you out of here after two more um, big things coming up. I know you're going to a film festival here in two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've done so much acting. Yeah, absolutely. You were in a yeah. movie with Morgan Freeman. I mean, yep. you're getting to achieve things that, you know, a lot of NFL players might mm -hmm. not get to. And it's because you've mm -hmm. always found more of a purpose both on the field and off. Uh, what are some of the exciting things coming up for you? I know we just said the book just came out, yeah. um, which you can buy that Amazon everywhere, mm. of course. And uh, is it playing ball? Is that playing ball? Playing ball. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I got the title right for people listening. Uh, but what are the exciting things you got coming up? Yeah, I got. Uh, well, I'm going to a film festival with uh, Steven Spielberg's daughter. Okay, uh, nice. Destry Spielberg. I'm in a film that she uh, directed. Um, excited about that. That film's gonna that that uh, the worldwide premiere is in Spain oh, on wow. October 10th. I have a two films coming out. Uh, 72 hours and uh, Plan B. Okay, nice. And do you know when those are going to be out? Uh, Plan B comes out sometime at the end of this month. I believe on the 27th. I have to check. Okay. And 72 hours is um, October, November, September, October, November 1st. Some ballpark. We're close. <laughs> What's this? September? September. Yeah, November yeah, 1st. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, Awesome, man. I'm, I'm so excited to see all of that. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know the significance of the date October 10th? I'm putting you on the spot now, but it's a good thing. Significance of October 10th? It's World Mental Health Day, and that's when you're, that's, oh, that's your premiere see, of the movie. See, the, the, the energy, see? That's see, what that's saying. perfect, right? We're in sync, man. Oh, my God. That's so good. Um, We're in sync. If there's uh, any, anything I missed, please let me know. But I, last question I leave with everyone is advice to someone that wants to follow in their footsteps of so it's a musician, an actor, an athlete, kind of asking that career, but which I can, I can obviously have you answer being, you know, a star in all those fields. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like to, to ask you the advice to the kid that might be listening, that sees themselves in you, that might be struggling with a parent that's going through the things your mom was going through. Mm 
Mm. Or maybe those feelings that you had as a kid, not having the care from your parents or maybe being able to trust the people around you as much as you would hope. What would you tell that kid that's that's struggling in that moment that that wants to be like you one day? I would say um, trust trust the process. Make sure you uh, you understand that the future is always brighter than the present. Just because whatever you're going through right now is always going to be temporary. Mm -hmm. Life is temporary. So understand that trial and error is a part of life. Failure is a part of life. Don't be afraid to fail. Failure makes us better. Mm -hmm. So embrace that and know that everything's going to work out no matter what you go through or what you're facing. Just keep pressing forward. Don't give up. Don't let your guard down. Stay focused. Treat people good at all times. Respect, honor your mother and father, just like you respect and honor everyone else. The feeling, the, the, the thing you said about temporary brings me to my favorite thing I say and the number one thing that helped me with my mental health. Feelings are temporary. You mm -hmm. think things are the end of the world and it's never going to end that pain. But if you do something about it, work on it, go to therapy, talk, help yourself, those feelings are temporary and you can't be happy again. So I just thought that was important to bring up at the end. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Vernon. Appreciate you coming on The Mental Game. My pleasure. Uh, good luck with everything. We'll be seeing you. I live out in Hollywood, so I'll see you out there soon. I'll see right? you in Hollywood. All right, cool. Just like my Hollywood smile. There you go. It is a Hollywood smile. Holy hell. I need to get my teeth right <laughs> after sitting next to you. Thanks so much, brother. Appreciate it. We'll see everyone right back here next week on The Mental Game. And as you can tell, Vernon is just a genuine good dude off the field. He's doing so much after his NFL career. You heard him mention his acting. He's got movies and shows coming out, obviously, sitting down for a podcast like this. And he is, again, one of the all-time great tight ends in NFL history. So a big thanks to Vernon for coming on The Mental Game. Next week, comedy. That is your one hint. We'll have a comedian right back here next week on The Mental Game. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.